Oh, praise God. Well, tonight we are going to talk about Insinium Amoris, which is the fire of God's love. It's also known as the melody of, of love or the honeyed flame. Touch your neighbor, say yum, yum. yum, yum. <laughs> Insinium Morris is a mystical fire of passion that causes the interior passion for Christ to burn so brightly that somehow it produces a physiological heat. A tangible spark of fire may even emanate from the body. This was a um, manifestation that happened to many mystics uh, that separated themselves for Christ and to seek him out. Now, there are two types of mystics. There are what are called anchorites, and then there are what are called hermits. It's important to understand the difference because you say, well, I'm not a Christian mystic. Well, in a sense, all Christians are mystical. That's why Paul said that when we pray in tongues, we pray mysteries, or the word is mysterion in the Greek. Each and every one of us are mystical because we're Christian. The guru, the Hindu, the, the New Ager can all claim to be a mystic. The witch, the warlock, the soothsayer can all pretend to be mystical, but Christ, according to Colossians chapter 2 in the Amplifies, he, he's the mystic secret. So there is no higher revelation than Christ. In fact, there is no one higher than Christ. Every, every spirit, no matter what information or revelation they bring, can never bring the high and the height of revelation that Christ can bring. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is no greater knowledge. There, there are what, what some, uh, some demonic mystics may, may call gnos, uh, Gnostic uh, mysticism, uh, but that is not what we are talking about. We are not talking about a higher knowledge to get more power. We already have all power. Ah, oh, you're quiet tonight. You already have all power in Christ. We're, we're not looking for greater power. We're not, you know, that's what witches and warlocks are looking for. They're, they're always saying, I want more power. Well, you already got Christ in you. You can't get any more power than Christ. You can tap into more of what's in you, but you, but you ain't going to get any more than what you already got on the inside. There will be things that are unlocked, but Christ in you is the greatest secret that you need. And one of the things that we see and was even taught this past weekend that we need to understand is that not all knowledge is revelatory knowledge. Not all mysticism is from Christ. I don't need a crystal or a, a shiny ball to teach me anything, to look into the future, or I don't need a crystal for healing. Absolutely not. Praise God. I can go on the crystal sea and just lay there. But there are two types of mystics. There are what are called anchorites and there are those that are called hermits. Now, an anchorite is a mystic that has anchored him, himself or herself to a particular location, such as a, a, a cell or um, a, a room that is connected to a church. That would be like Brother Charlie. If he was to be called to be an anchorite, then he would never leave this building. He would just stay here, maybe put a little bed back in the back corner <laughs> and just seek God 24 hours a day. <laughs> in my younger years, I could do that when I wasn't married and had no children. In Bible college, I had a little, it was like a little cell. God bless Pastor Rod Parsley. I mean those those rooms that he gave us double bunks. We had two. We everyone had a roommate. I mean, you'd step out of bed 
and like you could walk one foot or two feet in front of you, and that was about it. They were so small, uh, but that was my that was basically my prayer closet. Although my roommate didn't enjoy that all the time. <laughs> I lost a mini of a roommate. Hey, Scott. Yeah, it was so it was so uh, wild when I was growing up. When I was at Bible school, uh, they had to buy a new uh, bed for for my room because there was actually an indentation in in the uh, in in where I would just sit on my bed for hours and hours and hours. I actually ruined the mattress. <laughs> so they said this mattress is no good anymore. We had to get rid of it. Because I wanted to see, I wanted to see, because I'd heard about Catherine Kuhlman praying for 12 hours a day. I thought, well, what would happen if I prayed 15 hours, 24 hours? I had heard of other guys that were praying eight hours, seven hours. And, and I, I thought the consistency of praying every single day for eight to 12 hours uh, is going gonna, is, is gonna to get something. I mean, yeah. <laughs> By reason of use, I mean you're you're gonna you're gonna encounter the realm of the spirit. The 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 more intimate that you are with the Lord, and the more that you become acquainted with Him, you'll begin to understand the flow, the ebb and flows of the of the Holy Ghost. People say, "I want to learn how to move in the Spirit." Well, the best way to learn how to move in the Spirit is begin to pray. You'll instantly tell the difference. People are trying to teach people about recognizing the counterfeit. Well, if you if you know the original and you know the real, you'll instantly be able to tell what a counterfeit is because your spirit will be able to tell you. So, but an anchorite is a mystic uh, uh, that has anchored oneself to a particular location, such as a cell attached to a church. A hermit, a hermit is a mystic that is devoted oneself to contemplative prayer in, a, in solitude but isn't anchored to one spot. They could roam or travel. In other words, wherever they go, the, is, their, is their spiritual uh, prayer closet. They're underneath the cloud of His glory. They're in Psalm 91. Regardless if they are at an airport, getting ready to board a plane, on a bus, or... Uh, at, at, at their home, uh, in their prayer chair. Wherever they are, that's where God is. And, and so, uh, when we're going to get into a lot more of these different, these different types, because uh, you have the, the Desert Fathers, we're going to do a whole series on Desert Fathers, but the Desert Fathers were those uh, mystics that left the cities and went out into the desert, mainly in the Middle East and Jordan. I've been to some of these places where they hewed out caves in the middle of the of the uh, desert and the, the rocks, and they would seek God for, for years. And when the Spirit of God would move upon them, then they would go into the city, and the whole cities would be converted because of the power of God that was upon them. Some, some of the mystics um, separated themselves to such prayer that they never came into contact with people again. I think in some ways that, that is, um, that's not what God has called us to. I don't believe that we're, we're, we're always to be separated in Christ, but I believe that the Great Commission is still our mission Amen. as long as that we're in this physical body. So I like the hermit because the hermit is one that goes from place to place and they're still preaching. Um, and they continue to preach to every person they come into contact with. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of y'all are mystical and you didn't even know it. Some of y'all are hermits and didn't even know it. 
You're like, Brother Charlie, I moved out here with all my stuff in my car <laughs> and relocated to, to Moravian Falls because I've been called to be a hermit. Some of the singles are like, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I'm just kidding. So there are two types of mystics, the anchorite and the hermit. And both of these uh, two kind of uh, streams of mystical dedication would encounter some of the same types of manifestations. This is one of the things we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks. But there are in the 14th 14th century four particular uh, mystics that were used greatly. One of them being named Walter uh, Hilton. And then you have Richard Roll of Hampole. You have uh, the unknown author of The Cloud of Unknowing. How many have read The Cloud of Unknowing? Okay, that's it. That's you should you should pick that up, especially if you want to learn more about mystical prayer. You should pick that book up because it's the foundation for mystical and contemplative prayer. But these are the. The um, ones that I'm talking to you just for a moment about are the four main kind of giants in the 14th century in England that were in contemplative prayer. And then you have Julian of Norwich. How many have ever heard or read any of Julian Norwich's? Just lift your hand and, and wave it. Oh, my goodness. Well, you're going to have to just get on Amazon and grab some of her material. Uh, Julian of Norwich is the most well known in in, in um, out of the out of the four, and uh, I and Bryn, along with Eden and Nehemiah, actually visited visited her church in her cell, where she stayed because we lived for um, six months in England and we lived in Norwich. Where she, uh, where she resided, and she was a mystic of love. She was a mystic, and when you read her writings, her writings were engulfed with the flame of love of Christ. And I will tell you that when we went to her, her area, her prayer closet, and her. Um, her cell that she stayed in and prayed and worshipped the Lord in, um, you could feel the the presence of Christ emanating all off of the stones. There was a glory frequency, if we can use that terminology tonight, that that was uh, emanating off of the walls in that place. I mean, it was such a rich glory in there. You, in, in you could just feel it. I mean, in that time, uh, Eden was about five, and 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 she was a she was one of those bouncers and rollers and runners and shouters and glorious five year old children. How many understand what I'm saying? And when we walked into that cell, she felt the presence of God so strongly at five years old that she was literally walking like this. And we had just fed her a bar of chocolate. Nehemiah is a gamer. I mean, he's a gamer. He likes playing games. When we got into the into that area, he just folded up his game, game and he just sat there. And I said, you know, what are you feeling, Nehemiah? He just said, I feel the presence of God in here. And we didn't even tell him, this is Julian of Norwich. We didn't tell him 
that this is a, a mystic from the 14th century that dedicated her whole life to just seeking Jesus. But he could feel it. Touch your neighbor and say, I can feel it. Turn with me to Psalms 39. Talking about incinium amoris. This is the fire of God's love. This is the honeyed flame of Christ. This is the sweetness that will, will manifest upon the physical body. So much so that it becomes a physical fire that you can feel. Now some of the mystics would, would become so inflamed with the passion of Christ of the in, inner fire where like Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. It would become so inflamed with them that if you touch them, it would burn you. That even in the dead of winter, they would have to open up the windows and, and because of the fire that was physically upon the, these ones that were seeking Christ. There are, there are documentation uh, of many that encountered the Asinium Amoris that would in it that would go out and stand out in the snow in the dead of winter. And the fire of God would be so on them that the snow would melt. How many want to get on fire like that? How many want to get inflamed with the passion of Christ in you so much that the, that the menorah, just the seven spirits of God burn so brightly in your heart that you people, when they come around you, they, physical, they feel a physical heat. Not just that your face glows or radiates with the, uh, with the glory of God, but that when, so, when you touch, the fire burns you. 